Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. This is Thursday evening, April 23rd. And I do want to uh, share my appreciation for those of you who are subscribers already. I really appreciate the fact that you've committed to continuing this conversation, a conversation I think is worthy of a deeper dialogue between people on both sides of a political spectrum, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, even though it does, you know, it's, it's inevitably going to be more attractive to people that are on maybe the conservative side as opposed to uh, the uh, liberal side. But I think it's a worthy conversation nonetheless, and I appreciate you subscribing to this. Uh, I also want to ask that if you are a subscriber and you do find this content worthy, please share it with somebody that you think would benefit from this. And if you're just viewing it because it was shared with you, I appreciate you, if you like it, to share it with others. Um, you may or may not disagree with contacting the governor, contacting your state representative and your state senator. You may or may not disagree with my opinion. But my opinion is we need to contact them all and tell them that we need to get back to work on May 1st. We are responsible citizens. We will do the right thing. Uh, and, and if you really think about it, none of this has ended up being based on science. None of this has ended up being based on what the scientific data is telling us. It ends up being a political it ends up being political only, and it's illegal, and it's unconstitutional, no matter, I would say, lame excuses, the press conferences she's ran. We've had a peaceful protest, constitutionally allowed protest in Lansing last Wednesday. Yes, there were a few people, in comparison to the what the total amount was, a few people out of their cars. There were a few people with their guns. And it's a Second Amendment right to be able to carry your guns, regardless of what Joy Behar might suggest as being terrorists. I'm fearful that our, if there was an extension of this, that protests might not be peaceful. I think there'd be the potential for them to be more along the lines of what someone might consider riot versus a peaceful protest. And I don't want to see that. I want to see, I want to see that we get back to work. And even in the explanation that the governor gave, it ended up being that back in World War II, we rolled up our sleeves and we went to work. That's, that's what we're wanting to do. We want to go back to work. And most of the work that should be automatically allowed, not, not, not May 1st, right now, is occupations that are promoting social distancing as it is, open air construction work sites. The, the, these things with, uh, with landscaping, by nature, these are, you're working, even if you're on a crew, you're six feet apart. So let's get back to work. Please get engaged. Let's make sure our elected officials know we are paying attention. And, you know, I just want to, point out that the reasons for the COVID-19 shutdown, they were to prevent hospitals from collapse. That didn't happen. They were to avoid running out of ventilators. That didn't happen. We need more tests now. You can see, see how this transition takes place into they ask for a little bit, then they start taking a lot more. And so the, the idea that these mitigating aspects that we participated in led to fewer people getting the virus and dying. All of the data suggests the virus spread is much more contagious. The vast majority of us that are healthy have very minor repercussions from this. High 90% of the people that have passed away from this had underlying comorbidities. And the other aspect of it is, is that fresh air and sunshine, not being in your home, not being sheltered at home orders. The more we're out and the more fresh air we have, 
the more likely we are not to get sick. And this goes all the way back to 1918 and 1919 under the Spanish flu. The level of success with outdoor open air hospitals 100 years ago was overwhelmingly significantly higher for those hospitals that were open air and outdoor compared to those that were brick and mortar. So let's not suggest like mainstream media is telling us over and over and over again, because all of those numbers that they put together in those models already had mitigating circumstances if we took these measures already factored in. And they continued to have to, people are dying. And I don't want to sound like I'm, I have a lack of empathy. All of us, our heart is going to stop beating for all of us. And so it's the people most affected that have underlying comorbidities and we are all going to pass away at some point. I want to live. I want to live a life that is worthy of celebration. And so the other aspect of the reasons for the COVID-19 shutdown is we need more tests, PCR and antibodies. We are testing more people today than any other country on the planet. We need an army of tracers and trackers. Wait, what? You hear Fauci say this because the desire for the government to have a police and surveillance state is now a reality, and we're letting them do that. And then we need the COVID-19 vaccine because it's always, at the end of the day, about the money, and it's about being able to control us and to give us, have control over us with a vaccine. Let's talk about the money real quick because I've been saying, if you look back at my body of work, I've been saying that it is about money and control. And so, again, this is an article from Jim Rickards. I do read him a lot. And I do believe that he has a great deal of knowledge in how large, complex systems work and have converged at the same time. In 1998, Wall Street came together to bail out a hedge fund because they were using this leverage derivative trading. I've already had a whole podcast about that. In 2008, 10 years later, the Federal Reserve stepped forward to bail out Wall Street. So Wall Street bails out the hedge fund. Now you need the Fed to bail out Wall Street. Each crisis was worse than the one before. In the next crisis, who's going to bail out the Fed? Think about what that sentence asks. The Fed is now bailing out Wall Street and the U.S. Treasury. Who's going to bail out the Fed? This was more than just rhetoric. It was a clinical description of a pattern of worsening crisis on an approximately 10-year tempo, along with escalating bailouts. Now the worst economic crisis in U.S. history is here, and the Fed itself is in need of a bailout. A few weeks ago, the U.S. Congress passed a $2.2 trillion bailout bill called the CARES Act. This is the new law that provided $349 billion in small business loans. And guess what? Large businesses got it. Oh, they're going to give it back now. But they ran out of money very, very quickly. So they've had to reissue another hundreds of billions of dollars. And guess what part of this leverage is that mostly the people on the, on the left want is they also want to bail out the cities and the states, most of them that are, that are uh, democratically run, because they're upside down on their pensions and they're upside down on all their expenses. They've ran a bad business model and now they want the taxpayers. So the states in the, these states... And let's just use California, Illinois, and New York. Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, and New York City. Let's just say that they happen to be sanctuary cities. They happen to be against federal law. They happen to be sanctuary states against federal law. But now they want the federal government to bail them out as part of this. What does somebody living in Michigan have anything to do with the poor business adventures of Illinois or New York or California? What does somebody living in Montana or South Dakota or Oklahoma have anything to do with the bad business of a sanctuary city and a sanctuary state? This causes division. It, it, and it's, it's because you're demanding that you're, you're leveraging this. You're holding the bailout for the small businesses. And, and I don't agree with any of it anyway. I've already, I'm on the record of saying that but you're going to give it away to try to get more to push your agenda. It's all politics. The fund is dried up already with most businesses getting either no money or not enough money to survive more than a few weeks. 
Also buried in that law was a $425 billion bailout for the Treasury to recapitalize the Fed. Since the Fed operates like a bank, they will leverage that $425 billion of new capital into $4.25 trillion of new money printing to buy corporate debt, the municipal bonds, mortgages, and other assets in order to keep liquidity in the system. Okay, it's not just corporate debt. It's, it's corporate bonds that are considered A-rated, and it's corporate bonds that are considered junk bonds. We, we the people, represented by the United States Congress, House of Representatives, just gave permission to bail out and buy junk bonds that are going to be worth zero. We should be upset about this. The U.S. GDP is expected to lose an annualized $6 trillion or more in output in the second quarter. Jim Rickards estimates that 50% of retail and 90% of office rents aren't being paid right now. Many small businesses will fail and probably never reopen. I had always suggested that the IMF has the only clean balance sheet and would be the only source of liquidity in the world once the Fed was tapped out. Well, they're getting real close to tapping out. The world is running, is, is turning to the IMF for help. And that means printing the world money called special drawing rights, SDRs, to bail out the global financial system in the current economic crisis. So, SDRs were created in 1946 at the Bretton Woods Conference. That conference decided that the United States dollar was going to be the, the global reserve currency. They created a thing called special drawing rights at that time. They didn't use them. They used them like in the late 60s, and then they used them again on a very small level. Actually, I think he goes into this. It's right here. SDRs were used in a very small way during the 19, I'm sorry, the 2008 financial crisis. They did not have much impacts because the quantity was relatively small, about $250 billion to today's equivalency. And it took a long time to get it done. But the SDRs were issued in August of 2009, almost a year after the acute phase of the crisis and after the recovery had already begun. Still, the 2009 issuance was a good dry run. They wanted to test to make sure that the system still worked. The world has never been so deeply in debt as it is today. Low debt burdens are a robust to disaster for, for countries that are, uh, they're robust to disaster societies because they can mobilize capital and raise taxes and increase spending and rebuild when the crisis is over. But heavily indebted societies, like almost the whole, uh, you'd call it first world countries across the globe, heavily indebted societies are much more brittle. They just don't have the flexibility. So we're going to count on somebody else to bail us out. A normal SDR printing exercise requires that the total SDRs be issued to all international monetary fund members in proportion to their voting rights in the IMF. This means that the U.S. adversaries, such as Iran and China, would get part of the bailout money along with more needy countries in Africa and Latin America. And if you heard some of the behind-the-scenes little conversations, what do you think uh, President Trump says no to global currency at this point? This is what they're talking about. The U.S. is now holding up the new issuance of the new SDRs for exactly this reason. We'll see how this impasse gets resolved. Perhaps the new SDRs will be issued right away. But as the depression lingers and the Fed's impotence is exposed, the issue of printing a trillion SDRs will be back on the table. China may have their own conditions, such as a diminution of the role of the dollar as the global currency, and the U.S. may be more desperate when the time comes. Either way, this issue is not going to go away. The SDRs are going to be printed one way or another. SDRs were originally intended as kind of a paper gold. Once the IMF starts the printing presses, investors will probably favor real gold as a proper antidote. The COVID-19 pandemic will accelerate the demands to move away from the dollar as the world's premier reserve currency. That's because the crisis highlighted a weakness in the system. About 40% of the world's debt is issued in dollars. The Bank of International Settlements estimates that foreign banks hold over $13 trillion in dollar-detonated assets. And there's been a serious global dollar shortage as many nations scramble to find dollars to pay their dollar detonated debts. So this is called, this is where we see the dollar is so strong right now. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to drive down. They want to, they want to lower the strength of the dollar. They want devaluation before we get inflation. Okay, this is a serious problem because if dollars are in short supply, China can't control the currency in the emerging markets and they can't roll over their debts. The world is actually overdue for a monetary reset. Over the past century, monetary systems change about 
every 30 to 40 years on the average. Before 1914, the global monetary system was based on the classical gold standard. Then in 1945, a new monetary system emerged at Bretton Woods. I was at the Bretton Woods, this is Jim Rickards, he was at the Bretton Woods last summer to commemorate the 75th anniversary of that conference. Under that system that was originally set up, the dollar became the global currency, reserve currency, and it was linked to gold at $35 an ounce. And then in 1971, Nixon ended the direct convertibility of the dollar to gold. For the first time, the monetary system had no gold backing. Today, the existing monetary system is nearly 50 years old, so the world is long overdue for a change. Gold should once again play a leading role. Now, let me just say this. You had FDR, a Democrat, change the gold standard. He had a banking holiday, repriced everything, and he took it from a percentage of uh, dollar for dollar. Then it was only based on 25%. In 1971, Nixon took us off that uh, factoring uh, collateralized against gold altogether. So it was just we're able to permit, print money, and that's been 50 years. Something's got to change, and it's going to change, and it's not going to be good for most of us. Most of us middle-class Americans, hardworking, blue-collar, get up and go to work every day. Back to the article. International monetary figures have a choice. They can reintroduce gold in the monetary system either on a strict or loose basis, such as a reference price in monetary policy decision-making. This can be done as a result of a new monetary conference, a la Bretton Woods. It could organize some of the convening powers, such as U.S. working with China. I know that doesn't seem like it's a good idea right now, but it's probably going to be. Or they can ignore the whole problem, and they can let a debt crisis happen, and then uh, you're going to play out in interest rates and foreign exchange markets crashing, and then we're going to see the real price of, of real physical gold that you're holding on to and silver, that's going to go through the roof. Either way, something's going to have to happen. And as I talk about that we're going to have in the United States either a peaceful revolution to the voting process or there's going to be a revolution nonetheless and it's probably going to be less peaceful because people are just fed up. They want to get back to how we started. Same thing in the money, in the world. This is either going to happen and you're going to plan for it or you're going to wait till it's, it's catastrophic and you have to do something. The idea that it's the same force that made the dollar the world's reserve currency. It's, it's going to actually dethrone the dollar as the, as the world's currency because we're, we're, we're going to be dependent upon the IMF to bail out the Fed. Under the Bretton Woods system, all the major currencies were pegged to the dollar at a fixed exchange rate. The dollar itself was pegged to gold at a rate of $35 an ounce. Indirectly, the other currencies had a fixed gold value because they're pegged to the dollar. Other currencies could devalue against the dollar and therefore against gold if they received permission from the International Monetary Fund. However, the dollar could not devalue, at least in theory. It was the keystone in the entire system, intended to be permanently anchored to gold. Now, from 1950 to 1970, the Bretton Woods system worked fairly well. Trading partners of the U.S. who earned dollars could cash those dollars into the U.S. Treasury and be paid in gold at a fixed rate. In 1950, the U.S. had about 20 tons of gold. By 1970, that amount had reduced to only 9 tons. So because we were, a, we were uh, getting all of this exchanged, our gold reserves plummeted. And that's part of the panic that caused the decision for Nixon to take us off the gold standard. The 11,000 ton decline of the U.S. trading partners primarily went to Germany, France, and Italy, who earned the dollars and cashed them in for gold. The UK pound sterling had previously held the dominant reserve currency role starting in 1816, following the end of the Napoleonic Wars and the official adoption of the gold standard by the UK. Many observers assumed that in 1944, Bretton Woods Conference was the moment that the US dollar replaced the sterling as the world's leading reserve currency, but that's not true. It started taking place over a period of time earlier than that. Remember another phrase, slowly at first and then all of a sudden. In fact, the replacement of the sterling by the dollar as the world's leading reserve currency was a process that took 30 years, from 1914 to 1944. Remember, the Fed was created in 1913. A year later, it started the replacement aspect of the, of the world's reserve currency. In the period from 1919 to 1939, there was actually had two major reserve currencies, the dollar and the sterling pound operating side by side. Then in 1939, England suspended gold shipments, so the role of the sterling was greatly diminished. 
And in 1944, the Bretton Woods Conference was merely recognition of a process of the dollar reserve dominance that had started in 1914. The significance of the present process by which the dollar replaced the sterling over a 30-year period has huge implications for us today. Slippage in the dollar's role as a leading global reserve currency is not necessarily something that would happen overnight, but it's more likely to be a slow and steady process. We can't pick the exact date, but we know that it's happening Signs of this are already visible. In 2000, the dollar assets were about 70% of the global reserves. Today, the comparable figure is about 62%. If this trend continues, one could easily see the dollar fall below 50% in the not-too-distant future. It is equally obvious that a major creditor nation is emerging to challenge the U.S. today, just as the U.S. emerged to challenge the U.K. in 1914, and that power is China. The U.S. had massive gold inflows from 1914 to 1944. China has been experiencing massive gold inflows in the recent years. Gold reserves at the People's Bank of China increased dramatically. But China has acquired thousands of metric tons since without reporting these acquisitions to the IMF and the World Gold Council. They do things behind a curtain, a veil of secrecy. So based on the available data on imports and outports of the Chinese mines, actual Chinese government and private gold holdings are likely to be much higher. This creates a huge problem. China's gold acquisition is not the result of a formal gold standard, but is happening by stealth acquisitions on the market. And they're using intelligent and military assets and covert operations and market manipulation, but the result is the same. Gold has been flowing to China in recent years. This is gold flowed to the U.S. before Bretton Woods. China's not alone in its efforts to achieve creditor status and to acquire gold. Russia has greatly increased its gold reserves over the past few years. The ruble actually is the most gold-backed currency in the world. They have almost no debt. Iran has also imported massive amounts of gold, mostly through Turkey and Dubai, although no one knows exactly the amount because Iranian gold imports are a state secret. Also, you have the BRICS, the Brazil, India, South Africa, who also joined Russia and China in their desire to break free of the U.S. dollar dominance. Sterling faced a single rival in 1914 to the U.S. dollar. Today, the dollar faces a host of rivals. The decline of the dollar as a reserve currency started in 2000 with the advent of the euro and accelerated in 2010 with the beginning of the new currency war. So the dollar collapse has already begun and the need for a new monetary order will need to emerge. The question is whether it will be an orderly process resulting from a new monetary conference or a chaotic one. Unfortunately, it'll probably be chaotic don't count on the elites to act in time. And I want to give a shout out to Matt and Gino. It was brought to my attention that the Rothschild family and, the international, and their influence with the International Monetary Fund has always had some aspect of a desire to be able to take down the American dollar of its uh, position as the global reserve currency. And it looks like that that was not a conspiracy theory. It looks like they were speaking the truth. And so as much as you can look it up and it'll say that it's debunked that the Rothschilds have not, couldn't possibly have had that kind of influence, let's start using some critical thinking and not believe everything that is told to us in mainstream media. Let's start doing our own research. Let's start looking at what is considered conspiratorial at this moment because the conspiracy theories continue Enough time passes, the truth is told, they continue to be more right than they are wrong. So right now, we are frogs in lukewarm water, in a pot that is on a stove with a flame. It will be boiling at some point. If it was boiling when they placed us in that water, we would jump out. But we're swimming around right now thinking we're comfortable, no problem. We will be belly up in the boiling water soon. We need to take back our country. We need a peaceful, we need a peaceful revolution to take place through the electoral process of the people, by the people, for the people. If not peacefully, through the election process, then I fear that there will be a violent, nonetheless, revolution take place. Let's do this peacefully. Let's be responsible. Let's continue a conversation because it's more important to have peaceful dialogue, respecting each other. You, you, can, you can think I'm crazy. You can say I'm crazy. It's the 
unfriending on Facebook. I'm so glad I'm not on Facebook. It's the unfriending on Facebook. It's the, oh, F you, you're nuts, man, and you don't want to talk to me anymore. Let's have a discussion. I have love in my heart. Most of the people that know me see and understand and appreciate the fact that I care about people, legitimately care about people, those that I know and those that I don't know. I do not see so much empathy from most of our leaders, most of the people we elected. We need to take back our country and we need to do it now. Please keep score with what's going on. If you like this, please share it with somebody else. Thank you for viewing. I appreciate you and the time that you've put into this. I'm going to keep trying to do the best I can with not sounding like I know everything because I'm I'm, I'm in search of a lot of these answers. I just keep looking and I, I hear what you are saying. I hear when you say something to me and I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. The Rothschilds, huh? Yeah, now that's been debunked. And I even shared that with, with Matt at one point. And then I find more information that, wow, the Rothschilds actually have a very intricate aspect of control in the IMF. They've never let that, that's always been there. If you'll look back at the body of work, I continue to try to provide some information about these converging, very dynamic, large-scale trends that are happening right now. I appreciate all of you that have sent me individual texts sharing more information. The intellectual dark web, I'm becoming more and more familiar with this. And we need to have critical thinking be a part of our everyday life. I love free will. I'm so thankful that God gave us that as he created us. And I'm so thankful that God blessed me with being born in the United States of America, the greatest, most prosperous, most generous government, citizenry ever known on this planet. I'm so thankful I'm part of it. I'm James Detroit, and I'm out.